So we are going to shift gears and uh, we are going to look at uh, a very very popular uh, uh, supervised learning algorithm or supervised learning model I should say because there are many different algorithms for estimating this model uh, are based on decision trees, right. Can people at the back hear me, fine, okay. Um, so decision trees have uh, a very, uh, I mean very special place in uh, all this machine learning stuff uh, in that uh, they are very widely used, right and very poorly understood. Uh, no, in terms of, I mean, we talked about all this bias variance trade off, classification error, we can show convergence, we can show approximations, and a whole bunch of other things for all the linear classifiers, linear regressors, right? We know a lot about uh, uh, all the linear stuff, right? And uh, some of the non linear stuff like SVMs and so on and so forth, again, we have very strong theory. We know about convergence and things like that, right? With decision trees, uh, I can tell you what the problem is, and I can tell you what is the best known heuristic for solving the problem but I cannot even tell you how good the heuristic is, right. Uh, because uh, there are isolated results under very special conditions, people have some results on uh, how good the heuristic is, you know, that is this best possible tree that you can learn, right, and how close would it get you to the best possible tree, right. So, there are some very isolated results, right, uh, but there is nothing that is really uh, something out there that we understand well, right, and it is incredible because it is such a simple idea, it is a very simple classifier, right. So it is more or less along the lines of how humans do their decision making, right. So when you are trying to decide whether something belongs to some category X or some category Y, right, how would you think you go about doing it, right. You do not you don't create a hyperplane in your head, right, right. So typically what you end up doing is, okay, hmm, is this red? Okay, it is not red, okay, is it round? Oh yeah, it looks round and it's round and okay, it's blue. Maybe it's that, right? Essentially, what you are doing is querying some properties of the object, right? Or some properties of the entity at hand, right? Do I want? Uh, I mean, do I think he's a studious boy or not, right? Then, then I can ask all kinds of queries. Okay, mm, does he show up for all the classes? Okay. Does he sit in the first first row all the time? Is he smiling after quiz one? <laughs> right. So I, I can ask. I, mean, I can again build these things. Right. I can ask this series of queries. Right. And then I can essentially I'm building some kind of a characterization of the object. And then I say, okay, great. So this is this person is class one. Okay. This person is class two. Right. So on and so forth. That's the whole idea behind decision trees. Right. You are essentially trying to, if you think about what you are doing, you are trying to partition the input space into certain regions, okay, right. The feature 1 has value x, feature 2 has value y, feature 3 has value z and that gives me some region in state space. So what do I mean by that? Let us take a So the first question, let us just a two dimensional data set, now let us forget about all the um, all the relevance to real day, real life and things like this. So I have two variables x1 and x2, now I am going to ask the question, first question, here is a new data point, is the x1 of this data point greater than 0 0.6 or lesser than 0 0.6, okay, that is the first question I ask. So what am I doing in, in some sense, I am? So I am splitting this into two parts, if it is greater than 0 0.6 it will be here, if it is lesser than 0 0.6 it will be here, right. Next question I can ask is, okay, suppose x1 is greater than 0 0.6, okay, then is x2 greater than 0 0.2 or not, right, then what do I do, right. So this, this region is now x1 lesser than 0 0.6, x2 greater than point, I mean x1 greater than 0 0.6, uh, x2 less greater than 0 0.2 and likewise this is uh, x2 lesser than 0 0.2 and likewise here I can ask the question is, what kind of question can I ask here? 
come on just just say something random man don't think too much about it huh huh you can add then points make any conditions on x1 and then cascade it with x2 x1 you can do anything right so so typically they, they alternate but you can also ask a question okay is x1 given that x1 is less than 0.6 is it less than 0.3 or not or you could ask is x2 greater than don't give me some root 2 or something but 0.5 okay good right so okay as soon as i write that thing there it becomes 0.5 um huh so what is the regions that will characterize each the class aren't uh, rectangular but have some some but like like form some linear function and are like like say slanting boxes or anything i i i can i come to that a little later right so i am just trying to mimic the way we we try to think of things right so so normally what the, this is all of you were agreeing with me when i said okay you will think about attributes one at a time right so is, is the price okay is the tv screen of the uh, the right size then i'm going to buy or not right so it's like like that so i'm just mimic mimicking that process here okay then we'll come to other things a little later right it so i mean it will be really truly amazing if your true class labels are going to lie like this right what is the problem what what do you think is the likelihood that the class labels will actually be this kind of rectangular regions more discrete huh discrete it could be high i mean it depends on what process was used to generate the class labels if the labels are generated by doing this kind of region splitting obviously they will you have to find the right regions but uh, we are making some kind of an assumption right earlier when we made assumptions about linear right we are making some kind of an assumption about what the boundaries would be right likewise we are making assumptions here that there will be rectangles right so if you don't want to make the assumption that there will be rectangles then it's going to going to be little harder right so not only are these rectangles right there is something more special about these rectangles i mean they are all recursively generated right it's not like i can i can't just take some arbitrary set of rectangles and tile the space right they are recursively generated by first splitting it into two and then splitting each section into two and so on and so forth right it turns out right so this kind of recursive splitting is what is uh, most attractable to handle right and uh, for most of our decision tree discussion we'll stick with this right i'll come back and address that issue little later right about having uh, more complex uh, boundaries but almost all decision tree algorithms right all the approximations that we do for decision trees use this kind of recursive splitting of regions right can you use nested rectangle nested rectangle like like one inside the other like that how will you describe this region it becomes harder right see now each of these regions i can describe very easily right but if i start doing nested rectangles right it becomes a little tricky to describe the outer region right i can do something like this provided i'm willing to accept that right not so it's no longer a nested really no longer a nested rectangle because i had to actually fragment the outer region that will give you the inner rectangle but the outer rectangle you have to actually exclude it right i have to uh, the i have to specify the outer rectangle and then say okay remove the inner rectangle so it becomes a little harder to specify right so outer region can be determined union of other things okay union of yeah it becomes harder right i wanted to be easy i wanted to i want to represent this as a tree but then uh, the way you are uh, going it make it harder and harder so the biggest advantage of decision trees is the interpretability so for example this tree that i have this this region segmentation that i have drawn i can represent it as i i've been talking to you about trees right where is the tree right the segmentation i have right i can represent it as a tree so what i'll do is i'll first ask the question is x1 less than 0.6 right then if you say yes i'll go left then i'll ask the question is
right. So, I can very compactly represent this rectangular segmentation as a tree, right. You can see what is here. I am asking the question is x 1 less than 0 0.6. If it is true, I go to the right, right. And then again I ask the question is x 2 less than 0 0.5. It is true, I go to the right and I say that this is r 1, right. So, I am essentially here, right. Otherwise, I am here. Then going to the the other branch right, which is x 1 is greater than or equal to 0.6 I am this side and if it is less than 0.2 I am in R 3, if it is greater than 0.2 I am in R 4, right. So, I can very compactly describe this segmentation as a tree, right. So, what is nice about this tree? It is easily understandable, right. You show somebody, okay. So, you are building your, your this, you go out, you become a data scientist or a data analyst or whatever, okay. Some manager who makes like 10 times what you do, but who has never heard of a hyperplane in his life, right, comes and asks you for a, to build a classifier. Here is the data, build a classifier and then you tell him, okay, I have built this classifier and this new customer, you should label him as a buyer. Then he will ask you why, right. So, at that point, you just talk to him about optimal separating hyperplanes and, <laughs> and show him something, okay. Uh, well, then the, the next day probably the manager is going to be earning infinitely more than you, right. Uh, so, what you should, uh, okay. So, what you should be doing is showing him a decision tree, right, because that people can understand, right. People even with an MBA can understand, right. So, so you, you can see what is my recommendation to you guys after you finish your BTEC or anything, right, do not do that. MBA, but anyway, so that is easily interpretable, right? You say, oh, that is, oh, yeah, you should, you should classify him as a buyer because, well, this, this, on this parameter he is so much, on that parameter he is less, blah blah, and then there you go, right? The biggest advantage of decision trees is the interpretability. It's always easy to explain the decision tree to people. In fact, so much so that at one point uh, when neural networks were at their peak. You know, you know what is the biggest problem with neural networks? It's complex. Huh? No, no, the opposite of decision trees, incomprehensibility, right? This is interpretable. And neural networks are incomprehensible. Essentially, you say, okay, here is a black box. I don't even know what hyperplane it is learning, right? I mean, forget if you think optimal separating hyperplanes are hard. I can't even visualize what the neural network is learning, right? So you say, here is a black box. You throw in all your data at one end. Something will come out at the other end. You just take it on faith, right? Right, so, welcome to the church of neural networks, <laughs> right. So, so that is that's essentially how neural networks were working. So, when the neural networks were at their peak, uh, there was this whole line of research where people took a neural network, right, that was trained on your training data, etcetera, etcetera, and then tried to construct a decision tree that will give the same decisions as the neural network, it will give the same class labels as the neural network, so that you can actually understand what, has, what is happening. Okay. It, it, it sounds sounds weird, right? But remember that now I am no longer using whatever other heuristic I had for constructing the decision tree. I am using a decision tree which mimics the neural network. So, if the neural network learned some complex function of the data, right, I am trying to build a decision tree that mimics the complex function, right. So, it is it's a different decision tree that I would come up with than the one I would have constructed if I had used any of my decision tree learning heuristics on the data from the beginning. Okay, so, that is value to doing this, right, right. So, people, people do see that, right, that is value to doing this, right, because neural networks do something I cannot understand, right, but they seem to work, right, they give me a uh, wonderful answer and I do not know what that answer means. So, can I use something for, for which I know what the meaning is and try to understand it in terms of that, right. So, that is how useful decision trees are, right, even if you have a more complex uh, learning mechanism at hand, okay, sometimes for uh, interpretability sake. So, you can use uh, uh, decision trees, right. How expressive are decision trees? Hmm? 
right if you remember we had this discussion about neural networks i said if you have two layers of uh, weights that is three three layers of neurons right you can uh, basically represent any boolean function right i just the branching factor might be very high but then you can represent any boolean function so neural networks are universal approximators in that sense right so what about decision trees Right, you can it, you can be an universal approximator as well, right? I can just keep dividing, dividing and subdividing this uh, uh, space. Okay, it's just that my tree might become very very large, right? As long as there is some kind of guarantee on the function, yeah. Does it mean that you can repeat some variable? Yeah, I can repeat some variables. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, in, yeah, I, I could do that. Yeah. So, I mean, in fact, yeah, he was pointing out in the beginning. I could have as well drawn another line here. Yeah. yeah. No, as in like uh, one more line that like just within one of those boxes, not through through and. That, that's yeah. okay. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, that the discussion was when we were discussing about this line versus that line. Yeah, sure, I can keep doing this if that's your question. Right. Now this becomes a much more complex tree. Right. So now I have I'm splitting here once more. Right, I'll have another branch here. I'll have another branch here and another branch somewhere there. Right, so it keeps becoming more and more complex. I can, but the point is conceptually, you can represent anything. Right, so it is powerful in the sense that it's a universal uh, approximator. Right, and uh, it's just that the number of parameters can grow unbounded. Okay, and that's another thing, nice thing about it. It is non-parametric. Remember, we talked about what non-parametric means, right? So decision trees are actually non-parametric. It can just keep growing, right? You can keep adding parameters as you go along. 